Chapter 25. The Life Cycle of Transportation Systems That he not busy being born is busy dying. Bob Dylan. It's all right, Ma. I'm only bleeding. 25.1. A Metaphor To aid in trying to understand the behavior of a system over time, we have found the life cycle metaphor useful. Innovation. There is a period of development, the early days. It's a period of discovery. What should the system's predominant technologies and institutions be like? What will be its markets? Growth. Innovation is followed by a period of growth. Markets are captured. The technology is honed, and technology honing in the magic bullet, economies of scale, provide for increased efficiency. Maturity. Finally, the system fills its market niche. Spatial monopolies are established, and profits are generated and not reinvested. Technologically, stasis tending to senescence, politely called maturity, describes the situation. Marginal improvements may yield a polished present that looks healthy, but is failing to advance very much. Recalling the disjoint pattern of decision-making, we can say quite a bit about system change and system properties as the system moves along its life cycle. One property of systems, for example, is diminishing returns from investment in technology as the system moves through the latter half of its life cycle. Things move against technological limits. Cost-effective things get done first. For instance, the fan jet engines used by jet aircraft are approaching the limits on the thrust that can be obtained from them. The auto cycle engine is just about as fuel efficient as it can be made to be. On the other hand, there would appear to be increasing returns in the first half of the life cycle, perhaps as the fixed costs of investment, including both real fixed costs such as plants and research and development, and more amorphous fixed costs such as changing the mindset of producers and consumers decrease. The life cycle framework sometimes appears in different guises. Christensen's 2012 model suggests there are three types of innovations that capitalists may invest in. Empowering, which take elite products and transform them to the mass market, and tracks with what we call innovation in Chapter 4. Efficiency innovations, which reduce costs. This drives what we call the magic bullet, discussed in Chapter 10. And sustaining, which replace old products with new, and can be seen as the weak type of innovation we see in mature systems, discussed in Chapter 18. 25.2 Temporal Dynamics Throughout the transportation experience, we trace the life cycles of various modes. S-shaped curves are a key feature of this work. There are diffusion curves showing the realization of a system over time. The earliest known S-curve to track the diffusion of ideas was developed by Detarde in 1890, and Rogers, 1995, looks at the diffusion of the S-curve itself. One would expect curves of this shape, such as in the figure, for transportation is a product like others. It enters and floods a market. Some questions that arise from observing the process have to do with the positioning of the curve in time, the time it takes for the process to run, and saturation levels. Rule of thumb, we like to say that it takes 60 to 70 years for a transportation system to run its growth cycle. That time period corresponds to the waves defining parts of this book. But, for instance, for automobile populations, late adopting nations compress the time required. The growth of China in the late 20th and early 21st centuries is remarkable in regard both to the rate of motorization and its rate of infrastructure deployment, at cost to both quality control and environmental and social consequences. Having observed empirical regularities and having in mind a market flooding logic for them, forecasting comes to mind. Interestingly, however, S-shaped curves seem not to have been used much in transportation. Forecasters mainly extrapolate data linearly. Their thinking is that things just grow and grow forever. See Chapter 24. That kind of thinking reveals itself in present debates about future highway needs, in which it is assumed that vehicle travel will continue to grow explosively. We challenge that thinking. There are underlying causes to growth and travel, for instance, the rise in female labor force participation, that ultimately must saturate. Thus, we see a tapering off of vehicle travel, at least until speeds significantly increase. This has been referred to in the literature as peak travel, for which there is increasing evidence in the developed world, and complements discussion of section 24.5.1 on travel time budgets, although the phenomena are different. Rather than use interpretations of the behavior of systems available in transportation literature, Let's intermix comments on transportation with comments on other activities. S-curves of the type shown in the figure fit the temporal realization of transportation systems very well, as well as the deployment of many other technologies. Three remarkable things about S-curves have been observed. Stability. The curves fit the data very well through good times and bad, shifts in energy costs, and technological evolution. Symmetry. 
The curves are symmetric around a central inflection point. Stimulation. Deployment time decreases with time. For a place and system, the later in time deployment begins compared to other places, the less time it takes for deployment to be completed. We would like to know why the realizations of systems have those characteristics. Naturally, our interest goes beyond drawing curves to ferreting out the causes of their realization. What is there about structure and performance that yields the perfect S-curve? We see that service quality improved and cost dropped because rapid improvements occur in the hard technology. For instance, the railroads began to use more steel and less iron, fuel efficiency increased, and so on. Lagging somewhat, rapid improvement appears in the soft technology, control, organizational arrangements, government regulation, and so on. With networking and the growth of the market, economies of scale and scope are found. Investment in product development is high during early days of the life cycle, but as time passes, more and more attention goes to the process of production. For example, we saw in Chapter 15.8 that during the first decades of modern system growth, product development was an issue for highways. What should highway designs be like? That was answered by the end of the 1930s when freeway designs had emerged, although they still receive attention. How to build was the question somewhat later. It was pretty much answered in the 1950s when the interstate and related planning, institutional, and fiscal arrangements were put in place. The urban transportation planning process is an example of market channeling, and tailoring the product and process to its markets is very much at issue in today's mature system. A related issue is how a region adopting a product might switch from improving to an exporting posture as the life cycle progresses. Japan's early import and now export of automobiles provides an example. For a within-nation example, the western U.S. imported rail cars from the eastern U.S. in the early days. Now manufacturing is more spatially distributed. Behan and Lorente argue that S-curves can be decomposed from many processes into two components. The first is invasion, where flow invades a territory. This is analogous to construction of backbone systems. This is the left-hand side of the S-shaped curve associated with deployment. The second is consolidation, which is diffusion, perpendicular to the invasion lines, which we can think of as local or feeder routes. This is associated with the right-hand side of the S-curve. This two-stage deployment process is physical in nature, but may describe examples such as the construction of the transcontinental railways in North America. On the other hand, some processes are locally emergent, out of which the backbones emerge, so we'd be hard-pressed to give this two-stage process the status of law. Similarly, Perez decomposes the S-curve into a two-stage process denoted installation on the left side of the inflection point, turning point, and deployment on the right side. We call the whole thing after-birthing deployment, so the terminology is confusing. The installation period is subdivided into eruption and frenzy. Eruption is the period of disruption of the old along with a period of high unemployment. The frenzy period gives us financial bubbles. The deployment process is divided into synergy and maturity, which is also confusing as we use maturity for the period a bit later in the cycle. Synergy is described as a golden age when gains can be consolidated while maturity is the end of the cycle leading to disappointment or complacency. Neither of these two posited processes require or imply the symmetry that is observed in the deployment phase. 25.3. S-curve math. The S-curves in the book are largely displays of data. On occasion, we fit smooth curves to the somewhat noisier observations. We seek a curve that best fits the data, assuming the data take on a logistic shape. The life cycle model can be represented by the following equation. S of t over s max minus s of t equals e to the bt plus c, or the natural log of s of t over s max minus s of t equals bt plus c. We estimate the latter using an ordinary least squares regression model and solve for b, the slope, and c, the intercept, where s sub t is the system status at time t, for instance, the network length at time t. S sub max is the final market size, for example, the ultimate network length. T equals time, for instance, the year, and C and B are model parameters. The objective is to solve for C and B to best explain the relationship. One concern when using this for forecasting is to identify the final market size, S sub max. While we may know the current system size, S, to use an S curve requires knowing how large the system will be. The models can be fit for alternative final system sizes, one will best fit the data, but this is an inherent limitation in this kind of forecasting. In backcasting, explaining the deployment of already built systems, S sub max is apparent. To apply the model, it is helpful to estimate the midpoint or the inflection year, T sub i, 
it turns out that t sub i equals c over negative b. We can then predict the system size, s sub t, in any given year using the following equation. s sub t hat equals s sub max over 1 plus e to the negative b times t minus t sub i. 25.4 Spatial Dynamics This book largely explores the macroscopic factors that affect network growth, from birthing to maturity. However, these macroscopic explanations may not give us the specific information we desire, like where the next link on the network is going to be built or expanded, or what is the next link that should be constructed. For that, we need more explicit data in different kinds of models. The planning or engineering question of where all this activity should take place is addressed by the network design problem, NDP, which has received a great deal of attention in the operations research literature. It is hoped that if clear objectives can be stated for networks, they can be planned and constructed in an optimal fashion. A cursory glance at most large metropolitan areas suggests that road and transit networks are far from optimal, and that this is both an investment and a pricing problem, which need to be solved jointly. Early applications of network design in Chicago were described in Boyce 2007, which were a trade-off of user lifecycle travel cost, which decreases with road length, and upfront construction cost, which increases with road length. The analysis of network growth has received recent interest again with the rise of the internet, and it is thought that all transactional networks, transportation and communication, have similar structures and processes governing them. Broadly, we can think of several problems about predicting network growth. Node formation. Where will the next node form? Node expansion. How do nodes grow? Link formation. What two nodes are the next most likely to be connected with links? And link expansion. Of the existing links, which will be widened? As the networks decline, the same questions can be asked in reverse, leaving us with a link contraction, link abandonment, node contraction, and node abandonment problems. Node formation and node expansion are in many ways geographic questions, as many nodes depend on natural resources for instance, the location of free energy, and nature's networks, the location of harbors, easy places to ford rivers, and river junctions. Other nodes are formed by the intersection of the man-made network elements, the crossing of two roads, for instance. The geographer's theory of central places is an important element here. Link formation describes how and which nodes are connected. Within more recently built towns, many networks are in the form of a grid system, but over larger areas, for example between cities, the shape of the network is not so predetermined. Garrison and Marble, 1965, observed that connections to the nearest large neighbor explain the sequence of the rail network growth in Ireland. Yamans et al., 2003, developed a simulation that grows urban roads using simple connectivity rules proportional to the activity at locations. One illustrative network morphology dynamic is worth noting. In the case of toll roads, there is a corridor, say, between two major commercial cities, as shown in the figure. Early toll roads targeted end-to-end -end links along the corridor. For instance, the need for an improvement might be greatest in link DE, and a toll link is introduced there first. As other links are filled in, and as collector-distributor roads are improved, say HD, projects work toward marginal returns. In the case of canals, river basins form the context, and link-by-link -link improvements are made. For two basins, at some point the question of an upland link enters, a link between two river basins. Such links are generally expensive, for example, water supply is a problem in upland areas, and there are uncertainties of traffic between basins. Link expansion describes which links will be widened. As many points are already connected, it becomes the sizing of the connections that matter. The analog is scheduled service is an increasing frequency of service along a route. Yara and Levinson, 2005, simulate link expansion, showing that a network becomes a hierarchical network even if it begins as a uniform network with uniform land use over a finite area, with all links identical except for location. The network, like observed locations, exhibits power rule type of behavior, or at very few fast links, some moderate speed links, and many slower links. In brief, a hierarchy of roads would exist even if no planners or engineers intended it, and even if there were no central places. The question has also been attacked empirically by Levinson and Karamalaputi, 2003. They found that existing capacity deters expansion. There are diseconomies associated with expanding wider links. Similarly, cost deters expansion while total budget favors it. Importantly, it was found that increasing congestion on a link and on upstream and downstream links leads to expansion, suggesting that decision makers respond to demands placed on the network. 25.5 Infrastructure and Economic Development Macroeconomics versus Life Cycle Economics The decades since World War II have seen the growth of a considerable economic development literature. 
Transportation enters that literature in several ways. In particular, it is conceived of as part of social overhead capital, SOC, which is a basic investment that is necessary to development. It's one of the universal input industries supporting all activities. Other such industries include production of clean water and provision of sewage treatment and electricity. Infrastructure might be another name for SOC. Additional characteristics of SOC include its tendencies to be associated with large capital expenditures that have technical indivisibilities, are non-importable, and are provided or at least regulated by public authorities. A related idea is that of social savings used in Fogel's 1964 study of the U.S. Railways as an ex-post analog to ex-ante notions used in the analysis of projects. Identify costs with or without a project, compare the costs with the savings, Vogel used the idea of a counterfactual hypothesis. However, this research method has its problems. We don't have an identical United States that has evolved from 1830 without rail. While we may be able to determine the marginal contribution of additional infrastructure today, which may be small for mature systems, determining the marginal contribution 100 years ago is fraught with challenges. It is especially difficult to identify all the indirect or external effects of the technology. It is also difficult to value qualitative differences in transportation. Questions of how large was the social surplus from railroad development and to whom did it accrue remain unanswered. Discussion of transportation in the economic development literature often introduces the concept of linkages. The often used word spillover captures the same concept. Backward linkages lead to investment in input supplying activities. For instance, investment in highway construction may require investment in cement production. Much benefit analysis focuses on backward linkages. However, a critic would point out that any investment, even if it only involves digging and filling holes, would have backward linkages. Backward linkages should not be ignored, for some investments may have more socially desirable backward linkages than others. With respect to economic development, for example, investment in truck freight activities may provide an incubator for entrepreneurship compared, say, to a pipeline. However, the forward linkages matter more. How can we get a handle on forward linkages? One route is through the economist's production function. The neoclassical production function takes the form of Q equals a F of K and L, where Q equals the quantity of output, K equals capital input, and L equals labor input. The partial derivatives of Q with respect to K and L are the demand schedules for input factors. We may introduce transportation as an input along with capital and labor, so Q equals a function of K, L, and T. We know that transportation investment accompanied the growth of output. In France, for example, the figure shows transportation expenditures increasing as industrialization ran its course. Observations such as this observation about France say that there is some optimal investment level. In the United States, for example, figure 25.4 illustrates the investment in highways peaked in the 1960s. So this is viewed by some as a problem. Investment is not at the level where it ought to be. To counter the reasoning that infrastructure investment should be fixed over time, the point was made that emphasizes change as times change. In particular, in recent years there has been private investment forced by government requirements for cleaner cars, factories, etc. in response to environmental protection requirements. However, during the 1970s and 80s, it was reasoned that previous investments in infrastructure was endangered and underfunding didn't make economic sense because investment in maintenance and repair is more economical than rebuilding. That was a strong enough argument to drive some increased funding. Along with the potential for job creation, that argument has become politically salient. Thanks to David A. Ashour, an It Deeply Matters view of the investment shortfall crisis began to emerge in the 1990s. In a series of papers, the first appearing in 1988, Ashour pointed out that public capital expenditures on infrastructure ought to be included in economic calculations of the inputs to production. He specified an aggregate production function that used labor, public capital expenditures, and private capital expenditures as inputs, and examined how those inputs related to outputs during post-World War II years. Previously, economists had stressed private investment, including public investment, enables asking, does public capital matter? Ashour deserves credit for asking the question. He points out that the ratio of non-military fixed public capital stock to fixed private capital stock in the United States reached a peak of about 32% in the late 1960s and has subsequently fallen to about 23.5%. He argues that the decline has adverse effects on private investment, profits, and productivity. He supports the argument with a series of time series regressions made using aggregate national data. In addition to that finding for aggregate public capital, Ashour identifies core infrastructure with a stress on transportation, especially highways, where public capital investment matters very much. 
Swarms of naysayers and Ashour supporters have had their say also. Ashour's publications and findings, the findings of others, and debates about those findings are reviewed in a set of conference papers. Nadiri's research claims that the average cost elasticity with respect to total highway capital for the U.S. economy during the period 1950 to 1991 is about minus 0.08. That is, increasing highway investment by 1% will reduce costs by 0.08%. The average net rate of return from highway capital fell from 54% in the 1960s to 27% in the 1970s to 16% in the 1980s. The last number is close to the private rate of return, indicating a near-optimal level of highway investment. The question continued to be debated through the 1990s. In the 2000s, it has faded, and those advocating major new infrastructure investments have largely been successful. Productivity advances are the central issue in this literature, and productivity is improving when, year after year, output increases faster than inputs of capital and labor. The issue facing the United States and many other developed nations through the 1980s was the tapering of productivity advances. As Ashour and others have pointed out, the group of seven industrialized nations had average productivity growth of about 4% during 1960 to 1968, and growth declined to 1.4% per year during 1973 to 1986. We add that in 1987 to 1995, U.S. productivity fell even further to about 1.2%, but in 1995 to 2000, it rose to 2.3%. There was a sharp turning point in the late 1960s and another in the mid-1990s. Decreased productivity growth was the root of the failure of real incomes to increase and is seen as a culprit in the lack of competitiveness of the United States compared to its trading partners. Information technology may be behind the rise in the late 1990s as new telecommunication technologies, the Internet, mobile communications, were deployed. To get from raw comparisons and conjectures to processes, Ashour and others have estimated the coefficients of aggregate production functions. Data and procedures differ. Some studies made international comparisons, some used aggregate U.S. data, and others were on a state basis. Results range from Ashour's claim that a dollar of public capital investment increases output as much as does $3.30 of private capital investment to the finding of no relationship. That is, some adopt the position that stepped-up investment in infrastructure, especially transportation infrastructure, will re-energize productivity growth. Others say that's wrong. The previously cited Federal Highway Administration paper and conference reports summarized and compared studies. They seem to point to a weak positive effect. The comments made by researchers are interesting. Most suggest that there must be a relationship, but that large effects are not plausible. Henry Aaron, for example, remarks that few would question that the road building of the 1950s and 60s contributed to economic growth, but the claim that economic growth slowed because of the wind down of road construction goes too far. Perhaps there is a simpler explanation. Let's return to the S-curve. As the interstate highway system grew and matured, the marginal benefits decreased from each additional roadway. Most places were already well connected. And the marginal cost increased, the cheap roads were already built. It is natural that the economic benefits from new construction in a mature system would be smaller than the same construction in a nascent system. As the benefits of new construction decline, investment declines with it. The cause of the decline of growth is not the lack of investment. The lack of investment is the symptom of a mature system. We can explore this idea graphically in the figure. On the left, there are few roads, and travel has a significant cost in backtracking. In the middle, the number of roads is doubled, but the travel cost is less than half. On the right, the number of roads is again doubled, but the travel cost diminishes only marginally. A similar idea happens with transit schedules. If we have a bus running once an hour, the average scheduled delay is about half hour the difference between the actual arrival time and the desired arrival time. If we double the number of buses, the scheduled delay is halved, but that means it drops by 15 minutes. If we double the number of buses again, the scheduled delay is again halved, but this is only a drop to 7.5 minutes. We have a clear case of diminishing returns in terms of rate of return to additional transportation in both space and time as technology is deployed. Of course, there is little incentive to double the number of buses or roads again. It seems to us the economist's production function, while useful to economists, is too simple a representation of reality to capture the causal relations involved in transportation impact questions. Even economists have questioned its use in productivity analysis. Regressions specified as neoclassical production functions and applied to time series data have low correlation coefficients. There is about an 80% unexplained residual, and the thought is that technical change, not captured in production function analysis, is driving increased output. When interpreting results such as those shown by the figures above, Ashour refers to core infrastructure and especially to transportation. 
Is a shortfall of capital expenditures on transportation facilities hurting the U.S. in international competition? The following possibilities might be considered. First, Ashara's interpretation is correct. Congestion and other things are hurting productivity growth. That is surely the case for an organization such as Federal Express, but is the impact of congestion and the like on productivity direct, widespread, and large? Second, underlying common causes yield the downturn in investment and in productivity. A long list of causes comes to mind, ranging from federal budget problems, the high level of investment of engineering and scientific talent in defense matters, and high interest rates to Americans' attitude about not-in-my-backyard taxes and the environment. Third, there is an underlying relationship that is common among the compared nations. The nations differ because the relationships are driven by clocks with different settings. The United States pushed infrastructure development hard, and it has already achieved most of the productivity gains that can be obtained from present technological formats for infrastructure. For example, the technological format of the highway system. Western European nations are a bit behind in timing, and they are still capturing productivity gains. Japan is yet farther behind, and now China is capturing healthy gains. Fourth, the premise is wrong. The United States is not suffering in competition with other developed countries. Although the transportation system is far from perfect, productivity growth rates of the late 1990s suggest that it is investment in the next wave of technology, not transportation, which is most important. A good case can be made to establish the clocks with different settings assertion. All one has to do is look at, say, the pace of automobilization in the comparison nations. Similar timing patterns appear in railroads, domestic containerization, air traffic, and elsewhere. If three is true, the need for increased spending on infrastructure implied by one makes little sense unless the increased expenditures are focused on new ventures. 25.6 The Idea Q Queuing models describe how much delay there is in a system by looking at when the system is entered and when it is exited. For instance, if a vehicle enters a queue at 6 and enters at 6.15, it experiences 15 minutes of delay. One could sum up that time for all vehicles and estimate total delay. Rogers, 1995, has implicitly extended that concept to ideas or technologies themselves. They enter the queue when the knowledge is gained, they exit when the technology is deployed. Since knowledge itself faces a deployment process, this would give us an indication of the speed of take-up of a technology. See figure 25.6. The risk remains of over-adoption, the case when technologies are taken up too soon. Plank roads, for instance, discussed in section 3.9, were adopted before their full life cycle was understood, and they failed prematurely. Some patients with deployment would have been warranted there. In other cases, deployment of what turn out to be successful technologies are choked off and slowed because of a lack of capital. Delay is not of itself to be minimized, but rather traded off against the costs of rushing deployments, costs that arise because not all cost-saving innovations have yet to be wrung from the system and because of the extra expenses incurred in speeding deployment. For instance, more construction workers are used for a shorter period of time, rather than training and employing fewer workers over a longer period. Another perspective on the idea of Q is what technology consultancy Gartner calls the hype cycle. Gartner identifies five stages. Technology trigger, peak of inflated expectations, trail of disillusionment, slope of enlightenment, and plateau of productivity. Autonomous vehicles and mobile robots are still in Gartner's first stage as of 2012, so if Gartner's thesis holds, we should expect disappointment before deployment. This point of view is useful for disentangling short-term and long-term changes. 25.7 Social Impacts We tend to overestimate the effect of a technology in the short run and underestimate the effect in the long run. Amara's Law We observe that the social gains from improvements in transportation occurred fairly rapidly, that is hard on the heels of system deployment, as illustrated in Figure 25.7. There is a big impact early on, and impact then tapers. Those impacts reach beyond reduced costs to consider bringing of new resources into the economy, creating new options for social and economic activities, enabling enlarged labor sheds, and so on. The winding down of impacts as systems are deployed focused our attention on how new systems are created, what happens to them once they are birthed, and how transportation technology works generally. The re-energizing of social impact seems important. Also, attempts to improve existing systems late in their life cycle seem difficult to useless. 25.8. The value of being at the center of the world. The 1990s was a decade of explosion in information technologies. Led by the Internet and World Wide Web, a slew of related technologies were invented, innovative, and began to be deployed. Where they were first deployed was often the centers of high technology themselves. 
for instance, Silicon Valley and the San Francisco Bay Area. These areas often consider themselves at the center of the world, and in terms of leading edge technology, at that time they may have been. Residents there would have advantages such as broadband connections with cable modems, or, in the early 2000s, wireless connections for computers to the internet at selected hotspots, before people elsewhere had much of a notion of what was going on. This leads us to a hypothesis. If the rate of creation of information technology is accelerating, the leading places will pull farther and farther ahead. If it is decelerating, the trailing places can catch up and the relative value of being in the center steadily diminish. As we have noted throughout the transportation experience, most technologies follow an S-curve. During early growth, technology accelerates. It seems reasonable to suppose that some places gain the new technology first, and that place will usually be near where the technology was developed. We can call this the center. Once this may have been Detroit with the automobile, today in the most recent wave of technology this would appear to be places such as the Bay Area with information technology. To date, with previous technologies, we observed that during late growth and maturity phases, growth decelerates and the technology is spread around. There are a number of reasons for this, including diminishing marginal returns to innovation, at least in the short run, and the desire of capital to reap returns on investment by spending money on deployment into new markets rather than development of new technology. Will the advantage of being at the center remain? Are there advantages that accumulate at those centers that keep them dominant? In the United States, Detroit is still the center of action for development of the automobile, but aside from a fairly good highway network, offers little real advantage to those who wish to use one. While there are still spatial elements to the internet, one of its great advantages is as a destroyer of distance. Anyone connected to the network, which still may require being in the developed world, can obtain the latest software, information, or entertainment virtually instantaneously, regardless of location. But the physical infrastructure is still physical, cables must be laid, wireless hubs or towers must still be constructed, and the system cannot be assembled everywhere simultaneously. Michael Porter attempted to explain the competitive advantage of nations with a diamond model in which factor supply conditions, demand conditions, firm structure, and rivalry, and related and supporting industries were arrayed at the vertices of the diamond and interconnected. He made the point that you are more likely to get an advantage if there is a strong home market. So one expects snowmobiles to be manufactured in Minnesota, they are, rather than Jamaica. This might be expected to spill over to other small motor industries like lawnmowers. It does. These factors are mutually supporting, so complementary industries help lower supply costs and may increase local demands. Having competitive firms, which may at first blush seem a disadvantage, may result in thick markets and attract consumers. Being first certainly aids in mutual causation that supports a locational advantage during the life cycle of a technology. Whether it sustains over the evolution of technologies is not, is not at all clear. Some seem to, for instance Silicon Valley, others, mainframes in Minnesota, many computers in Massachusetts, peter out. 25.9 Specialization Chapter 3 of Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations, 1776, shows rather clearly what improved transportation does for society in its production and consumption activities. Transportation improvements are constructive because they support specialization of production and consumption. Efficiencies result from specialization. Transportation improvements also have a destructive side because they tear down existing arrangements, shift the holding of resources and wealth, and so on. There are gainers and losers, and that puts strains on the social contract. In theory, we might expect government action to ease that strain. Side payments would be made to those who lose so that no one is worse off. That is an equity, not an efficiency matter, of course. Side payments are discussed when there are undesirable externalities. That's an efficiency matter, for actors should pay the full costs of their actions. The only side payments we have seen in our discussions so far are payments to those forced to move by urban highways and railroad construction. Interestingly, the need for payment was argued by social activists rather than by efficiency activists. The real-world pattern seems to be this. As systems begin to be deployed, the voices of those who are gainers and those who expect to be gainers swamp those who lose or who will lose but may not know it yet. It is only when most gainers have already gained and their voices are muted that the voices of losers can be heard. For example, the expansion of the railroads to the west destroyed most crop agriculture in New England, but the voices of New England farmers were swamped by the voices of gainers. When examining the literature of the 19th century, we have seen specialization mentioned, but not much, and it is not mentioned much at all today. Our speculation is that it doesn't fit the prevailing paradigms of economics. Indeed, in 1951, George Stiegler looked back at Chapter 3 of Adam Smith in an article sharing its title, 
the division of labor is limited by the extent of the market, dismissed chapter 3. He took the title as a theorem and took it the tack. If it is true, industries are characteristically monopolized. If false, Smith is wrong. Of course, he found Smith incorrect. He had to, otherwise economics would have to deal with industries having spatial monopolies. As will be discussed later, chapter 26, we think the opportunities created when transportation and communication systems are innovated and deployed trigger waves of innovation and development cycles broader and deeper than those recognized for the model building cycle. The movement from one life cycle to another is discussed in chapter 26.